never had rats. I'm still having trouble with the, the rat problem. Ugh. I'm pretty sure they're mutant rats or something. Really, Michael? This is terrible. It's disgusting. Pay attention to your work. You are a filthy boy. Mm. I can train you to be a true groomer. Sad, dirty man, baby. A doggy style is to the stars. Your girl, your love of your life, coming tonight to your rat palace? I really wanted to recreate my favorite horror movie. But with cats. Hello and welcome to the Sean Kelly on Movies podcast uh, for the first time in a few months. Uh, I guess this is going to be my habit with this podcast is that I will only post an episode whenever I have uh, something to post. Uh, Hopefully I sound better this time because I'm trying a um, different method of recording the podcast. So hopefully... um, You can actually hear what I'm saying. So uh, I should probably um, start off with a little housekeeping and um, mention uh, my uh, new page on Patreon, uh, which is my um, efforts to um, try and um, monetize my blogging a little bit. So um, if you uh, go to uh, patreon.com slash skonmovies, uh, you can uh, become a uh, patron of the site and get access um, to um, some various uh, bonuses. Uh, so um, the only uh, bonus I have up there right now is a exclusive audio interview with um, Alexandra Philippe, who um, directed the... Uh, film 7852 which uh, played at Hot Dogs last month so um, the um, interview proper won't be released until the fall so this is a nice bonus if you uh, go to Patreon and become a Patreon for $5 a month you can get access to this interview and that's actually the um, subject of uh, today's episode is the uh, interview I did way back last year at the Fantasia Film Festival with the people behind the film She's Allergic to Cats. Uh, this is a, a very um, weird film which you have to uh, see to believe and you can actually see it this weekend at the What The Film Festival which will be happening on Saturday, June 24th at the Royal Cinema in Toronto. And this is the um, film festival organized by the uh, Laser Blast Film Society, which uh, show a selection of films which are quite weird. And I uh, will say that She's Allergic to Cats fits the bill quite perfectly. And I had a great conversation with the people behind the film and... I will let you hear it in its entirety. Though I spent all that time to record that very nice sounding intro and I uh, forgot to give some more details that the interview is with um, She's Allergic to Cats um, director Michael Reich and uh, star uh, Mike Pinkney. And I should also note that there are some spoilers in this um, interview as well as quite a few tangents. I hope you enjoy. Uh, how did uh, She's Allergic to Cats come about? Um, She's Allergic to Cats came about I guess just by you know real things in real life happening. Uh, I really worked uh, as a dog groomer mm-hmm. and, um, and, I, and then I really wanted to make a movie so I figured just use the things that I had around me which were you know, dog grooming and my house. The movie takes place in my house, and then uh, and then my best friend Mike Pinkney, who, uh, who who stars in the movie, who plays a weird version of, of, of both of us kind of both of us combined. Yeah. Mm. So was it all 
Well, I know it's the, the, the character name is the same as the actor name. Is the, yeah. So does he play like an exaggerated version of himself? Or? Yeah, an exaggerated version of, of myself <laughs> in sort of like in his life. You know? Yeah. So it's it's like we've always collaborated really closely. So it was sort of a merger of both of us because we've all both been going through the same thing for so many years. It's sort of both of our stories I to think, some extent. I think I told you to play it like Mike Pinkney from three years ago. Uh, yeah, less confidence. Yeah, <laughs> Mike Pinkney from three years ago, but in my life. Yeah, it's all heightened. You know. It's a movie. <laughs> yeah, some of it's true, but a lot, some of it's not. Yeah. So, what was the creative process for the film? Um, the creative process. Uh, I guess, like, what part? The whole thing. Which or? is, um, how did you decide what you're going to shoot and like? Oh, I mean, I guess, I mean, writing the the script took uh, a bit of time. <laughs> Uh, and I, th- I think you know a lot of the creative process was it was almost just using the limitations of, of my life and what I could get access to, uh, and and then you know like uh, I knew I could get a, a, a crappy van because that was my crappy van, <laughs> so I put I wrote that into the script. Um, I knew I could get uh, you know a racquetball court, so well maybe not the racquetball court, but. Well, yeah, just like, you know, the authenticity of yeah. it, it yeah. you know, it registered as truth, but it was also easy because it was it was you, so you put yourself out there and put me in it because you had ultimate access, I wasn't mean, doing anything else, so yeah. if we needed to do pickup shots whenever. We could he always... watches a lot of movies. <laughs> <laughs> well, were, so, oh. were you aiming for the film to be more experimental than, like, having a cohesive narrative? <laughs> okay, I think, I think it's, star- oh, hey, thank you. Coffee. <laughs> Um, thank you. Oh yeah. Uh, I think, I think, when the movie started, I wanted it to be more experimental, but then it just kind of be wound up being, like people would be, oh, you should make it more accessible, more mainstream. Yeah, you were sort of guided into the more cohesive version of it. Yeah, and then in editing, I then brought it back to how I originally saw it, which was a little bit more experimental uh, as far as the narrative goes uh, and, and, the, and the style and stuff became a little bit more experimental yeah, like there's a lot, a lot of random stuff that just happens in the film <laughs> yeah yeah but I guess you know in life random stuff happens <laughs> and uh, you, you just like you know you just deal with the randomness of life <laughs> so why the title She's Allergic to Cats um well I like I like Movie titles that are, you know, uh, different. Mm-hmm. Um, I think the title came from, from a forest. forest. Had a bad, had a date with a girl, a friend of a mutual friend of ours, actually, who's one of the editors. Yeah, he had a date with a girl, and she's like, "Oh, she's great, but she's allergic to cats." So yeah, that's and a, I, and that's a deal breaker. And I was really, I thought it was the funniest yeah, yeah. thing ever. Oh, and that, and then I wrote that down. And I was just like, that's that'd be a good title for yeah. a movie, but I never really thought much about it. There's but so then, many toss away titles out there, like it yeah. could happen to you, you know. And it's like, <laughs> that's a real movie. Like, like Nicholas Cage. Yeah. I like movies. I like movies that are that are that are sentences. Yeah. I know. And I, well, just like during the movie, I was like waiting for the. She. I. I actually thought that 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 was going to be that line was going to be spoken at some point. <laughs> I, yeah. I guess it doesn't need to be because it's the title of the movie. It's, and it was well, like it like. Like, a, like, like Cora, instead of saying she's allergic to cats, she says she hates cats. Yeah. And you just assume that's because she's allergic to cats. <laughs> yeah, there's something else going yeah. on. It creates an underlying tension because you know a little bit of like, oh, yeah, like, how these places are going to come together yeah. because of the title. How is she allergic? Is it going to be funny? Is it going to be sad? Is it well, going to be scary? Well, that, well, you pretty much like had it like the, the cat was like a horror character coming out from the doorway. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, yeah. I don't really like cats. <laughs> I like dogs are great. See, oh, I, I, I I love dogs. You, yeah, right. I it's an affection thing. I well, that's the thing. I think like cats and dogs. I think are are most representative of 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 who you are in a, in a weird way. I think like you know cats are they have this cats have this weird like god complex and I cats are cute until they they're not. Yeah, yeah. The kittens are cute, you know. But I think dogs dogs just they just love and want to be loved. Dogs have more dependency. Yeah. And, and cats are, they, they expect you to do things for them. Um, yeah. But dogs are better actors, too. Well, you toyed with changing the title a couple of times. Yeah, I was thinking know, people of just... Like, don't give away... The, but it's like, yeah. it's kind of the punchline of the movie. In a yeah, sense. it's a punchline. Well, the, the film does have a great poster, so how, how did that oh. come out? 
the poster uh, is done by um, a, a good friend of mine, John Camisa, who's a Philadelphia-based artist, and he's done, he did a whole series of reimagining uh, cult movie posters, and, and the the exhibit was called uh, what, Dead of the Living Night. Dead of the Living Night, yeah. Dead of the Living Night. It's this great splatter, kind of, what's the, uh, who's the um, guy that did Hunter S. Thompson stuff? Yeah, it's like Ralph Steadman meets, uh, like, cult movie posters, really. Yeah. And so, uh, I gave him, and, and I was, like, heavily influenced with American Werewolf from London, it's one of my favorite movies, and I think the, I, I showed him, like, the, the, the Polish movie poster for uh, American Wolf in London I was like make something like that with cats yeah it's like <laughs> so a weird wolf that yeah. you know is sort of like painted yeah, it did a variation of that yeah. and uh, yeah I mean there are a lot of within She's Lurched to Cats there are a lot of really hidden deep cut movie references baked into it well, and the Carrie stuff well the yeah, Carrie even stuff even when she has her fit and knocks over a tape so you can see an American Werewolf in London tape hit the floor real quick yeah if you look. and even like I was talking to somebody last night and they were like oh that the monologue that she gives about the ducklings that's like the gremlins monologue where she talks about uh, uh, her, her dad dying from uh, you know, yeah well from she has a duckling like the ducklings monologue kind of like really suggests that Cora was a sociopath <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. I, I got that too. Yeah. Even though you kind of already got that hint when she like just breaks into the house. Yeah, well, that's kind of charming too. Yeah. I I love going on dates and and breaking into places and stealing things. That's like, that's a good date for me. Actually, when I was younger, now yeah. I'm like, the, the, I don't you know, know if that I was like that. five years ago. Date for you. I still break into places on dates. Mm-hmm. Yeah. So how long did this film take to edit with all that? Experimental video art and stuff. Edit, okay. So the first, we started out with uh, one of my really good friends, Forrest, who's an amazing wizard of editing, uh, and he edited the whole movie kind of nearly. Yeah, it was originally a day in the life. Yeah. (laughs) And he edited it for about a year uh, and finished the first cut of the film. Mm -hmm. And then I kept on wanting to get my hands on it, and he edited Premiere, and I didn't know Premiere, so I had to learn Premiere, and... Then it was, I, was it two years of... Yeah, so we together kind of took it in and yeah. just spent the next two or three years working out of a meat locker in our old office. <laughs> it was an abandoned yeah. convenience store. And we just poured over this thing and just kept, you know, changing it up, you know, playing with the timeline and adding more of the video art to infuse into it so that we really got that it sort of devolved into the video art by the end of the film. Mm-hmm. Yeah, it was all shot on red, shot in 4K, and and then when we would do pickups, we would do them red, and then we would do them in scarlet, and it would be 2K, and then we would do it on 5D, and then all of a sudden we are using mini DV, and so we just kept on using all of these different formats, and... Mm-hmm. And then, and it, it, it kind of like segmented the movie in a weird way, but then when we took everything and then... Put it first. We put it to DVD, then mini DV, then VHS, then back to mini DV, then back to the computer. It just made everything look yeah. like the same amount of crap. Yeah, well, yeah. The film had a very VHS aesthetic to it. Yeah, yeah. yeah. And we found ways of being able to kind of overlay that with the HD to sort of dial it in and out when it was too much because you didn't want to like not be able to read words because it yeah. was too pixelated. Yeah, a lot of oh. layers oh, yeah, upon layers. No, 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 like, well, it is kind of sad that they've just like, announced like, they're discontinuing VCRs. Wait, are you serious? There's a really? Japanese company that yeah. made the last VCR. And really? They're, they're stopping now. I didn't even know anyone was still building That's it. fucking awful. <laughs> yeah. They, you know, I, I bought a VCR... For, I think to do like dupes of this stuff and it just wound up eating my pumpkin head tape. So we used the same the first, VCR. Yeah. There was a VCR that I bought when I was in high school mm-hmm. and that one's still kicking and it's... it's got uh, the right blend yeah, of tracking, yeah, bad you know, tracking. Because every one you, you play it through they have a different set of tracking and, and mm-hmm. you know, and it's, so that was the right look for us but that one is probably... It's a workhorse, yeah. Yeah, it's like 25 years old. <laughs> yeah, but that's really sad to hear that. Yeah, that but like, all. there are like... Like, I think, well, even though VCRs have been, like, non-mainstream for, like, 15 yeah. years, yeah. I think there's still, still, like, a lot of collectors out there. Yeah, you can get them on eBay. Yeah. I, I just bought one recently, you know. Oh, you did? Yeah, and you get them for about 30, 40 yeah. bucks. And, but, you know, it's like, if these break down, I don't know how many shops will still fix them in the future, yeah. you know, if you don't keep them in good shape. 
Yeah, I remember like even learning how to edit. I did. It was like video toasters, like editing back and forth. And that was oh, like the yeah. coolest thing to be able to. Before computer editing, that's yeah. what I did in high school too. Just like, you know, pause and record between two VCRs. Yeah. That was fun. Yeah. So, um, what do you hope um, audiences will take away from keyboard tech? I mean, <laughs> I hope that. You know, I think. Gen okay, well, one, I hope they have a good time. Uh, I hope they laugh. And I, I hope, but there is, I, I think that, that one of the underlying messages in it is that you gotta look at the, you gotta look at the, the, the good things. Because you could focus, you could fix it on, on the little things that you don't think are right in your life or with you or, or, or in your story or in your narrative. But, but you gotta, you, you gotta, you gotta find your own bananas, you know. Yeah. Manage your expectations. I mean, everybody before they, before they meet, I mean, you're just starting an opening phase of dating. There's always this idyllic version of a girl, like before you filled in all the blanks of actually knowing. Well, them. Yeah. well, well that's, yeah. it. that's interesting about the film is because, for like most of the film, Cora's face is out of focus. Yeah. Yes, mm -hmm. <laughs> this like entity that hasn't been fully sketched in yet. Yeah, it's because she's a, she's a dream girl. She's mm -hmm. not like. She has flaws, <laughs> just like the main character has flaws, just like we all have flaws. Yeah, and there's mm -hmm. so many movies where, like, you know, you're waiting for two people to meet, and then they're perfect for each other, and like yeah. this way, you're maybe not so sure that they have, that's they should it, be together. That's she how might, it works in the movies, yeah, but yeah. that that's not how she it works. Might not be right for him in the in the good movies. Mm -hmm. Sitting with a bowl of bananas and watching Congo. <laughs> yeah, I mean, isn't that your dream date? I mean, <laughs> shit, that would be amazing. Find that right girl, man. <laughs> I've never seen Congo. <laughs> oh, oh, it it's is not, it's not good. good. It's not even good bad. It's like just well, so, well, I, well, I don't know about Congo. Is that like a like I think it's I think it was like going after the success of Jurassic Park oh, yeah. because it's also based oh, on Michael, Michael Crichton. Michael Crichton. Crichton. That was yeah. the whole Michael Crichton crew. They made like Rising Sun and all these movies. Oh and my god, Disclosure. Sphere. Disclosure. Yeah, and they were just all, none of them were good. Yeah, the only good one was Jurassic Park. And yeah. I remember so, I like, saw Jurassic Park, it came out in, 90, I was in like sixth grade, and I was like, this is the coolest shit ever. And I just read, because I had read every like Stephen King book, and I started reading every Michael Crichton book, and I really liked Congo. Actually, I think Sphere was my favorite. But both, Congo, yeah. yeah, but Congo was the one that came out right after Jurassic Park. And I was like, this is going to yeah. be amazing. We both read the book of that when yeah. we were kids. And it was such a letdown. Disappointment. And when you're young and a movie lets you down, it's like movies shouldn't let kids down because kids, kids don't know what a good let, yeah, movie nothing is. Nothing should let like, kids down. Yeah. That's the moral. Like, yeah. Mm -hmm. Can't let kids down. But it's such a fun movie, a stupid movie to like champion. Like, who enjoys it? And like, just to find the one person that like loved that movie. Yeah, because I think a lot of a lot of uh, people from our age group were all let down by this movie. <laughs> you know? Yeah, it's just a you know, it's an awful film. Yeah, I mean Tim Curry has a terrible accent. Ernie Hudson's accent. Is... He has this like almost made-for-TV quality about it. Like, yeah, it's really who, all these who, hammy performances. Who directed it? Was it Barry Levinson? Or he directed Sphere. <laughs> Barry Levinson directed Sphere. Who directed? Who directed Congo? I jeez. <laughs> but yeah, um, Congo. <laughs> it's just something nobody's talked about in so long that makes it funny. You know, if you pick a cult movie, then it's so oh, yeah, everybody loves yeah. Repo Man. But you know, Repo Man know. is really good. Mm -hmm. yeah. Actually, I think this movie has some similarities to Repo Man. Maybe <laughs> you know, there's a stilted sense of dialogue in that movie too. Yeah. It doesn't quite take place on Earth. It's like a bizarro version of, of LA. It's kind of lo-fi punk rock effects in Repo yeah. Man, and lo-fi punk rock effects here. Uh, and Repo Man is an LA story, mm -hmm. and, mm -hmm. and so is also so the is, underside of LA. Yeah, you know, the gritty, you mm -hmm. know, you know, impoverished side. Okay, so when it all comes down to it, what would you say that she's allergic to cats is really about? <laughs> uh, I guess it's really about um, looking for some form of acceptance and recognition, isn't it? Just kind of yeah, yeah looking void for your place. Uh, I, I guess, I guess it's about finding out how to finding finding things. It's about <laughs> yeah. 
I think everyone just wants to make their mark, you know, and, and so many people are struggling in dead end jobs and they fancy themselves an artist, but you know, you don't you never see these closet artists, you know, toiling away in their homes and that, that, that private struggle of living in obscurity is something that nobody really shines a light on. I think everyone is a lost dog. You know, when it really boils You're down to it. Just looking to be found. Yeah. Mm-hmm. By their owner to tell them what to do. and something to, Someone to appreciate them. Feed them. And it's funny, too, because it's like, you know, if, if, if everything worked out at the end, that wouldn't be, like, what real life is. It's like you just have shitty circumstances and you just get, and then, then more shit just gets piled yeah. on you at the end. It just gets worse. Yeah, and then really you die. Because, like, Rambo, he's going to die. <laughs> you know. But yeah, the circumstances don't really change for the main character. It just gets worse. But that's kind of hopefully in a funny way. But better. Way. I think it's a happy ending, actually. <laughs> I think it's a happy ending. I think it's a bittersweet, which is the best kind of ending. Yeah, it's like he gets. Well, I mean, don't spoil it, but. <laughs> <laughs> you know. uh, yeah, wait, what was the question? What is it about? <laughs> how would you define your mood? Oh, how do you define it? No, just keep talking. Oh, <laughs> I, okay, I think the, the way to define it is. Uh, it's a, a lo-fi. It's a lo-fi neo cult classic experimental love story. horror melodrama. Yeah, you know, with romantic comedy vibes too. Yeah. You just threw the kitchen sink in there. No, I didn't. I didn't say. I, ne- I don't. I never said comedy. Say, yeah. Black comedy. You, you, we shot it so long ago. It's almost a period piece. <laughs> yeah, because I think we said it. We said it like five years before we shot it, which is now. That's a while ago. Yeah. It's from, this is like, Bush era movie. Maybe. I mean, you know, there's never really specific time period. That was one of the things that we tried to gravitate towards, too, with like running it through the VCR. When a movie is so freshly of the now, mm-hmm. you must judge it a little harsher. When you see an old movie and you can't really tell how it's made or it feels like an old tape, you can distance yourself from it and take yeah. yourself out of like whatever era you're mm-hmm. in now and sort of you know, get lost in the story a little bit more. Yeah, it's almost like, I think I want this movie to feel like you found it, yeah. you know? It's like someone, you know, from the 90s made it and they, you know, died and it was under their bed. <laughs> <laughs> well, like, uh, a Boy in a Plastic Bubble, like, that's like a TV movie that is like this kind of weird, terrible gem. Uh, but you, you'd find that, you'd like tape that off of TV on crappy VHS, and that's, that's how it would, would exist. I mean. Yeah, I mean, we grew up in that era where you know, we just had shelves and shelves of tapes, and your mom would tape like Ghostbusters off Showtime, and the first yeah. five minutes would be missing, and it's like that was your video library. <laughs> yeah, I, I had, I remember the Disney Channel, you know, you would get like sometimes you would get the Disney Channel, like they would yeah. get free preview. yeah, free previews free and stuff, preview, yeah. and then so like I had a free preview. And, and my parents taped Old Yeller off of the Disney Channel, and I think the free preview ended before Old Yeller ended, so like it just end, ended. So, so he's still alive. Yeah. So <laughs> when I saw Old Yeller, Old Yeller became rabid, and then and then that's how it ended for me, like because uh, that's how the tape ended. Um, yeah, they just worked it out. They, yeah, they just, they just kept a rabid yeah. dog. He went to the vet. caged, and you know, and, yeah. Good movie though. That's another movie about dogs. Yeah. <laughs> Okay, okay, I'll be it. Cool. And that was my interview with the people behind She's Allergic to Cats. If you want to see the film, it'll be playing at the Royal Cinema on Saturday, June 24th at 9.30 p.m. And the filmmaker will be in attendance at the screening. That is all for um, this episode. I'll see you whenever I come back.